Good morning. We're still in creation and evolution. And uh, over these last uh, couple of months, we've gone through strengths and weaknesses and fallacies and points for and points against and all that kind of thing because actually we're dealing with two religions, two philosophies, two faith-based things. In other words, it takes faith to believe in either one of them. You cannot really scientifically believe in evolution. Uh, you can be a scientist that believes in evolution, but you can't be uh, a scientist because you're an evolutionist. That just won't work. It's sort of like uh, we have all kinds of people and they choose to be Baptist and they choose to be Methodist, Presbyterian, or whatever. And it's the same thing. You can be a scientist and you can, you can choose to be an evolutionist or creationist. You do not have to be an evolutionist to be a scientist. They were scientists a long time before there was any thought about, about evolution. In fact, most of the early scientists that made the big discoveries that are now laws uh, were believers. And uh, you can, there's a, several books put out talking about all the early scientists. And they were Christians, they believed the Bible, they believed in creation, and they believed in all of that. And so what we've been doing is we've been working this list, keeping sort of track of uh, the fact of this one coming from the unknown and by some unknown source, unknown energy, it just self-actuating, bringing itself into existence from nothing. And then later on, self-actuating again and organizing without any type of divine creator or anything or any direction or guidance, it organized itself and become living cells. And the thing about it, if all this is so smart without a creator, then why is the future the death of our star? And the death is life as we know it. And why is it competition of survival the fittest to the point that the scientists believe the insects are going to win the battle here on earth? That the insects will inherit the earth. Of course, Matthew 5 doesn't say that. It doesn't say the insects will inherit the earth. And so you see, we really have a, a difference here between opinions, between philosophies, between faith. And one is based in self-actuation, or in other words, no God. And the other one is based in a divine sovereign creator that spoke it into existence then why would someone over here that believes in divine sovereign creation want to go over here and borrow this technique and bring it over here and say that God used evolution to do it? I mean, it's as if God's hands were tied and God had to use evolution. He said, well, maybe he didn't have to, but he chose to. Well, that's not what the scripture says. Scripture says he divinely, sovereignly spoke it into existence in six days and said it was very good. And that's one of the first things we have to do is we have to, we have to believe the Bible. We have to believe a sovereign divine creator is, is the God of the Bible. And we have to believe the Bible and we have to have faith in the Bible that it is a God's inspired word. And we have to quit poking all this uh, challenges at the Bible. Uh, whether did Moses cross uh, the Red Sea up in a swamp or in the north part of the arms of the Red Sea or did he go across the Red Sea? And, uh, you know, if the Bible says he raised his staff and the Red Sea parted and they went across on dry land, I have no problem with believing that. And they said, well, didn't have time to dry up the mud in the bottom. Well, a God that can part the sea can make the bottom of it dry without a doubt. See, well, you see, it is a difference in, in a belief system. And uh, the belief system here, it just offers no hope whatsoever. It's hopeless, it's despair, it's chaos, it's survival of the fittest. It, the morality is determined by man himself as to what he desires morality to be. Ethics are determined by man. Everything over here is determined by man. Everything. And one of the surprises I think I've shared with you is why would anyone who believe in evolution want to be a conservationist? In other words, why would they want to try to specially protect an eagle or loggerhead turtle or or a snail darter, why would they want to try to do special treatment to try to protect a species when it's supposed to be survival of the fittest? They, they're interfering with the very thing they believe in because nearly all the naturalists I know are evolutionists. The ones out here trying to save the spotted owl, 
trying to save the snail darter and all these things. Nearly every one of them I know is an evolutionist. Why are they trying to save something? Why are they interfering in their own belief system? And it'd be sort of like us Christians saying uh, we, we, we need to scrap the Ten Commandments. Don't believe in them, you know. But we're Christians, you know. But we don't believe in a, in a God-ordained uh, system of morality. Well, you can see here our future, though, is, of course, headed uh, to eternity. Of course, eternity exists right now. We're already living uh, in eternity. We are eternal as we are in this room right now. Now, these natural bodies are not eternal. But we are eternal. We are not going to go through some kind of stage of metamorphosis or change or something like that. The only metamorphosis we go through is when you go from an unbeliever to a believer. Now that is a metamorphosis. You go from death to life. You go to, rather to eternal death. You go to eternal life. That meaning that you have eternity with the Lord. Not that you have life, but you have eternity with the Lord. Well, that's uh, where we started but uh, what I'd like to do, let me put this one back up for a minute, just have something on there, because uh, I wanted to share with you a couple of more articles, just yesterday's paper. I mean, it's every day in the paper. They're, they're striving so hard to keep evolution on the forefront. And the reason I want to share a couple of these articles with you is because I'd like to ask you all, how many articles have you seen on the front page since Mount St. Helens blew off after the eruption and you heard about all the ash and all the darkness and you know the chaos of the explosion itself how much did you hear about Mount St. Helens after that about canyon building cliff building ancient sea wave marks on the hills across on the other side of uh, Spirit Lake and the fallout of the logs the log mass floating on the lake the knock off of the bar the formation of pre uh, coal on the bottom of it and the formation of polystratified uh, circumstances for petrification of trees on the bottom of Spirit Lake, the something of the ground because of the melting of the ice chunks of the glacier and making terrain that looked like the Badlands of South Dakota, the making of a 140th model of the Grand Canyon in one day, and also the making of 600 feet of cliff in two years. Now how much of that have you heard on the front page? You haven't heard any of it. And it's not going to make it in the science books. And it's not going to make it in the natural books or geology books or anywhere. It's all going to be written off as an anomaly. Just like footprints of dinosaurs and footprints of men uh, uh, fossilized in the same strata. That's an anomaly. A gold chain and a lump of coal. That's an anomaly. Uh, a drawing of a dinosaur on a cave wall out in Utah. That's an anomaly. In other words, anomaly is something they can't explain with their theory, so they set it aside and say it doesn't apply. Well, you can't throw out information in a scientific uh, technique. You have to include all the information. You are a, a unfair, dishonest scientist if you exclude things you find. Well, here, earliest arrivals in Americas could have originated in Japan. And I thought that was interesting. And it just goes on to say that uh, some people who lived in Japan, it was not the Japanese because Japanese weren't there yet. And uh, it says they were the first to cross a land bridge from Asia and settle in the Americas. It said, uh, according to a new study that examined the bone structure of 10,000 human skulls. In other words, see here we are back studying these skulls again. And uh, it says, examination of skulls from around the world suggests that the first Americans were most closely related to the Jomon, J-O-M-O-N, a prehistoric people who lived in Japan thousands of years ago. And said the skull measurements and other evidence suggest that this group crossed what is now the Bering Straits. That's between Alaska and uh, Russia. And you know, it's not very far across there up there at the nearest point. You can actually see on a clear day, you can see into Siberia and Siberia, well, East Russia, and can see into Alaska. And said they crossed what was the Bering Straits and migrated through the Americas from Alaska to the tip of South America. It said these are not the people that now live in Japan. But said they, Jomon, had some characteristics of Europeans along with Asian influences. In other words, you hear what they're saying? These first people crossed that land bridge. They had some of the same characteristics of the, of the Caucasians and also the Mongoloids, both. They had characteristics of both. Well, that's true. Every one of us had all the characteristics of Caucasoid, Mongoloid, Negroid, Australoid uh, back uh, a few thousand years ago. Because as we've been discussing, there's no such thing as race. So suddenly these 
these ancestors to our American Indians and the people in South America, the Incas, the Malayas, and all those people, they, they are assured now that they came across the Bering Strait when it was uh, connected by land. Said the first immigrants reached the Americas 15,000 years ago, and within 1,000 years, were living all the way to the tip of South America. Remember how after the Tower of Babel, the confusion of language, and they scattered out and went to the far corners of the earth, and they were able to do that, remember we talked, because the ocean, a lot of the water had been caught up in ice, and the level was lower, and all the continents were connected together. Let's see what the article says. At the time of the first migration, ice covered much of the northern world, causing the nor nor worldwide sea level to drop by hundreds of feet. Notice they had it to drop first by hundreds of feet. The Bering Strait, which is not much deeper than 60 feet in most places, was not there. Instead, there was a dry land bridge from Alaska, Siberia. So in other words, uh, they, they can't get around the evidence. The evidence is there. But they had to have the uh, ocean water to drop. And uh, they said because uh, the ocean was up and it dropped, and when it dropped, the people could cross. And uh, actually what happened... Uh, that for the for the water to level to drop, they would have had to have uh, warm water, and they would have had to have uh, cold land masses to form the ice age. And you can't get there from there or here with uh, the old ice age theory and the heating and cooling of the earth from the formation of the earth. It won't work that way. Only after a a worldwide flood, a great deluge, tremendous amounts of water that's come from underneath the ground where it's warm, and then the land mass is cooling down, and then the convection of all this to cause that ice cap. And said, uh, said the first migrants are now clearly seen in many of the American Indian tribes, including the Blackfeet, the Sioux, and the Cherokee. A second migration came to three to 4,000 years ago, but they had to paddle across the Bering Strait, which was now filled with water. The massive northern ice sheet melted. See, it, the same information's out there, it's just a matter of how you interpret it. Was all this the result of a worldwide flood, and the aftermaths of the flood, and the people scattering because of confusion of language, and then the ice caps melting, and isolating them, and when they got isolated, they were there with isolated genes with certain propensities and being favored in such a way because of the weather or things of that nature. And so intermarrying amongst these groups consolidated the genes and gave rise to what today we call race. And in some cases we call uh, nations or natives or tribes. And actually we're all human beings. Well, they said they looked at 21 bone characteristic in ancient skulls to come up with this information. Well. I just thought that was interesting that, uh, that they, they, they agree that the water level at one time in the ocean was much lower than it is today and it's higher now than it was at some point in the past. There was a giant uh, ice cap and the ice cap melted and shut people off and isolated them. You see it's these early migrants that came to the Americas that built all these things that we have down in Central America, South America and even here in the United States. We find all these temples and, and uh, different uh, irrigation systems and all these things everywhere. And these people are the ones that built them. Well, here's another one. This is really a good one here out of the paper yesterday. Astronomers see haze from which stars are formed. In other words, they have now discovered a shadow that's been in existence since 10 billion years. A shadow. And they found this shadow way out in space, looking at a quasar. Well, a time, uh, this, this was called the Cosmic Dark Ages, a time so ancient that stars and galaxies had not yet begun to shine. And then on down it says, it's the birth of stars. And on down. They're trying to map large swaths of the universe and catalog some 200 million celestial objects. This is just in one little part of the universe. They're trying to map 200 million objects, in other words, stars and things of that nature. He said, there were no stars and no galaxies up until this point. In other words, there weren't any. Now there's, there's 200 million just in this one spot, but there weren't any back when this shadow formed. This is when matter finally got organized. Now remember, 
Matter is organizing itself. Who's doing the organizing? Nobody. It's organizing itself. It is self-actuated without direction or energy. Because you can't create mass or energy. It has to come from somewhere. The first law of thermodynamics says there's only so much mass and so much energy. You can convert mass to energy and energy to mass, but you cannot create nor can you destroy any new mass or energy, see. And uh, scientists have long believed that after the explosive genesis of the universe 13 billion years ago. See, they, they're slipping it in now and they're, they, they, everybody just conveniently forgetting that the universe was how old? 3.5 to 5 billion. You remember that figure? I don't know if you remember that or not. They just taught that just like it was the gospel truth uh, up till Hubble telescope finally got fixed. And they looked out there and they could see 13 to 15 billion years out there with this fix on the telescope and all they saw was more and more and more galaxies and objects. And if they get a bigger, more powerful one, what are they going to see? More and more and more and they'll have to have the earth now and the uh, universe 20 billion, 30 billion, 60 billion. As far as they can see, they're going to continue to see galaxies and all these universe, this, in this whole universe because the scripture says man cannot measure God's creation. It's right in the scripture. There's a verse to that effect. Man cannot measure God's creation. That's futile. It's a waste of money. It's a waste of large amounts of money. And it uh, says, okay, the explosive genesis of the universe, 13, billion years ago there followed a barren lifeless period the dark ages before gases from the explosion could coalesce into stars and galaxies like the ones gleaming in the sky today you see what they accomplished in one sentence they went from nothing to something to stars and galaxies in one sentence without any explanation whatsoever it just happened well, it took 13 billion years to do it but that's okay because given enough time, anything can happen at least once. That's a basic uh, uh, tenet of evolution. Given enough time, anything can happen at least once. And if it can happen at least once, with unlimited time, it can happen as many times as it needs to to get from A to B to get C. So in other words, I can hold this pin up here. Over enough period of time, of me turning this pin loose, or somebody else, and somebody else, and somebody else, over enough time eventually when they would go to turn this pin loose, one of these days it will float up and lay on the ceiling. Given enough time, anything can happen at least once. And if it can happen at least once with unlimited amounts of time, which evolution has, then anything can happen as many times as it needs to be to get from A to B to get C. In other words, anything can happen if you believe like that. No limitations whatsoever. Because I've already seen in my lifetime the age of the universe go up from a few hundred thousand years to 13 billion. Just in the last 10 years I've seen it go from 3 to 5 billion to 13 to 15 billion. Just in the last 5 years or so. In other words, anytime they need more time, they're seeing more and more universe, they just arbitrarily add it without any thought process at all. They just throw away the old figures. They don't even worry about them. They don't worry about the fact they've been wrong. See, that's the whole point. They've been wrong. They say, oh no, we're just updating the information. It doesn't sound that way to me. They sound so absolute. This sounds absolute. But the universe expanded and cooled. Large amounts of that gas remained in the form of hydrogen atoms. Where did they get these hydrogen atoms from? From nowhere? From nothing? How'd, how'd they come into being all these hydrogen atoms? I mean, it would have taken billions and billions of trillions and quadrillions to have even got it started if it could have occurred this way. And the laws of science says it cannot occur that way. And watch this. In a way eerily similar to the dawn of Earth, the fog would have quickly burned away as more and more stars were born. In other words, stars are just born by themselves. Their light ionized the hydrogen, making it essential transparent. So, the universe started off the first half billion years being very hot because the initial explosion called Big Bang. 
Has the universe cooled? The dark ages dragged on for hundreds of millions of years until stars started forming and finally ionizing the gas and the fog suddenly lifts. And now they say, they saw what they believe is a shadow caused by the last traces of that fog. I mean, Nick, the last, that much of that article is the names of all these brilliant scientists and how smart they are, how brilliant they are. They always want to sort of include that because they want to let us know they're very smart and they're very brilliant. See? But you see somebody reading these things, you say, well, that's just the Lexington Herald. Well, you have to remember, though, all these articles continuously coming out like that. And then we, we talked about the biology books and how it's all in there. And last week, we were talking basically about, um, about this thing of uh, the National Academy of Sciences and their pamphlet they put out uh, on the teaching about evolution and the nature of science. And then we talked a little bit about biology books, and I gave you some illustrations out of some of them. But there's been an answer written to this pamphlet, and it's this little blue book right here that I refer to from time to time. And uh, in this blue book, if you remember last week, uh, we went back here and, and uh, we looked at these photos, this photo here of all these embryos that looking exactly alike for the bird, the fish, the turtle, the man, and all that. And uh, actually down on the bottom picture here is what they really look like. And some evolutionists just a few years ago, this thing had been accepted for over a hundred years and was in all the biology books. And this is taught in all the med schools. It's taught in, in every biology class, science class, everywhere. The similarities of embryos. Comparative anatomy. The biology classes a comparative anatomy, whole class on comparative anatomy at the university. And it's talking about how that the anatomy, the whale's fin and a man's arm are the same. The front leg of a horse and the, the front leg of a dog are the same. We, we all evolve from similar structures. Not a word of truth to it. Cannot be proven. And this turned out to be an absolute fraud. And evolutionists proved it was a fraud. They finally got just tired of this and evidently they did some research. Well, of course, embryos are now available now where they weren't before. And uh, so in comparatives, they found out these embryos were so different, there's no way they could be similar. There's no way that this can be used to show that we came from similar background. And then I opened up my biology book that I used to teach biology out of right now. And a very fine biology book. And they're, like I was saying, I used two different ones back and forth a year or two of peace. And both of them include this in it. And this has been known to be a fraud uh, since about, uh, oh, 10, 15, 20 years, 30 years ago. In other words, it's known to have been a fraud. But they're still including it. And uh, because it, it's uh, handy. And it, it seems to try to prove that, uh, that we all got started the same exact way. We have gill slits and we have a tail and these embryos were drawn by Dr. Heckel uh, strictly to prove that. Incidentally, Dr. Heckel was one of the prime inputs into the philosophy and the theory of Nazism on race superiority and trying to purge and cleanse the races. And of course, you know how the Nazis set about to do that, and that was to exterminate those that were determined, to, get this, to have inaccurate head shapes. Too much, not enough distance between the eyes. An ear lower than the other ear. ear. Facial features. They decimated the, uh, the, Jew, the, uh, not only the Jewish people, they decimated the Slavic people, and they decimated the gypsies. And they just decided by taking measurements, these were inferior race evolution. And they tried to exterminate them, trying to go for the super race. And so that's one of the things that's come out of this, this teaching of this, uh, this uh, hereditary thing and evolution and superiority and the survival of the fittest. Well, so we sort of address that and uh, we want to draw to our attention that this whole pamphlet that the National Academy of Sciences put out contrasts religion and creationism together and they contrast it with evolution and science. In other words, they're saying evolution is scientific, but creationism is strictly a religion. 
and that way they exclude themselves uh, from declaring themselves the evolution as a religion, which they really are. It takes faith. Uh, they, you can't really prove anything. Uh, it's not subject scientific ex uh, exploration or investigation. You cannot do scientific investigation on the past. You can only do it on the present. And you certainly can't take the present and say this is how it happened in the past because you don't know if the rate that you're observing today is the same rate that occurred in the past. You see, that's one of the basic tenets of evolution also, uniform tyrannism. That at the rate things are occurring today, that's the rate they've always occurred at. Therefore, we just measure the rate today, and then if we find out it takes a river a thousand years to eat one inch down into rock, then how long did it take the Colorado River to eat the Grand Canyon one mile deep? And that's what they used to think. Of course, no reputable scientist today, evolutionist or otherwise, believes the Colorado River cut the Grand Canyon. But I still see that in books. That's what's amazing. Even when it's, it's thrown out, like these embryos are thrown out, like uh, the Colorado River cutting the Grand Canyon. Even though those things totally been thrown out, you still find them in science books. Now, all these books have an editor, and they have an editorial board, and they're supposed to go through and remove things like that. We also talked a little bit about the dinosaur, the brontosaurus, a, a dinosaur that does not exist, still being put on display in some of the museums because it's their most popular exhibit, even though it's either a terrible accident or fraud. Because the head is from one dinosaur and the body's from another dinosaur, it's a combination of two dinosaurs. There's a lot of fraud, a lot of fraud involved. Well, let's get off of that. Let's move to Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens, very fascinating thing. Uh, they knew it was going to blow up quite a while before it did, but it really came at 8.32 and 17 seconds Pacific Standard Time on May 18, 1980. Now, how long ago has that been? 21 years. That's not very long ago. In the lifetime of nearly everybody in this room. It is the best observed geological event in the history of the Earth and the most documented event. I mean, this event is so documented, it's, it's almost unbelievable how documented it is. We know a lot about Mount St. Helens. In fact, uh, one thing we knew, we know how tall it was before the explosion, how tall it was after. That's easy. But we know a lot more about what happened around Mount St. Helens. Well, let's look at Mount St. Helens for a moment. And uh, you can see here Mount St. Helens was 9,677 feet tall before the explosion. When they were able to measure it after the explosion, it was 8,377 feet tall. And the whole entire top and the north slope was blown away. This volcano did not explode upward. This volcano exploded sideways. Very unique. And uh, this part of the mountain right here, incidentally, was heaving. You actually, you could almost feel it heave. You could stand on it and almost feel it heaving. And the heave rate was tremendous. And it was, it was looking like the blowout was going to occur on the side like this because of this great big dome that was heaving on the side of the mountain. Now there was a guy by the name of what? He was a Harry Truman, wasn't he? Y'all remember that? A Harry Truman had a lodge right here at the base of this mountain right next to this lake. Well, this lake's now 200 feet deeper than it was before the explosion. And this mountain over here, there's three mountain ranges over here. They were just sort of hills compared to this one. These were just a few hundred feet high compared to this one up here, several thousand. Th these might have been at a thousand feet, I'm not sure. But this was a, a high lake. This is Spirit Lake. Tremendous amounts of forest around this. And if you fly into Seattle and it's a, a clear day and this thing's sticking up above the clouds or it's in the clear, you can actually see this entire area just blown out of this mountain. And it is fantastic at the amount of energy this thing expended. It expended what's equivalent of a, 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 like an atomic bomb we dropped on Hiroshima, Hiroshima at the end of the Second World War. It was like the equivalent of one of those going off every second for so many hours. In other words, just tremendous amount of energy. And uh, just blew the mountain away. Well, in blowing the mountain away, uh, it blew about three-fourths of it toward, toward the Thule River. 
and about one fourth into Spirit Lake, right down the mountain into Spirit Lake, in Ridge One, Ridge Two, Ridge Three, and this was 800 feet high right in here, where the waves came up on the side of this mountain. This the hills were higher. Ridge One was higher than that, but the water when this hit, when this one fourth of the mountain top hit in this lake, the water had to go somewhere, and it climbed 800 feet high up on this hill on the other side, and when it came back and sloshed back and forwards. It made wave marks that looked like old ancient wave marks that the geologists uh, over on New Guinea and different places, they, they have these wave marks. And they say these wave marks were made by the ocean going up and down over millions of years. Yet right here, we have the same thing made up against the side of this mountain made in just a day or two. You know, so how, how can you say every time you find wave marks somewhere on an island or a continent somewhere and you say, oh, it took it millions of years to do that. How can you say that when we have an, an observable event? This, this falls under scientific investigation right here. This is observable. They had pictures. They know what it was before the explosion. They know what it was after the explosion. They know the explosion occurred. They recorded it. It's gotten still pictures. It's got in movie pictures of it, uh, video pictures. And so it's, it's a very well-documented event. And so we know how those wave marks were made right here. They were made when Spirit Lake had to empty itself and go up and slosh back and forwards. And it just took this hill here down to the bedrock and left these uh, wave marks on it. There was a photographer right here on top of this ridge, third ridge out, and he was photographing this straight on when it went off. And there's also an airplane flying over here on this side and these people got the best observation of this explosion of anybody. This one here really was worried for his life here. You might have uh, uh, seen that one in some of the coverage where he kept his camera on and he was going down the mountain on the opposite side and these black clouds rolled over. It got darker and darker and he was talking at the same time. There was one photographer that was photographing this. I forget where he was and he knew he had pretty well had it. So before that pyro pyroclastic cloud got to him, which was a couple of thousand degrees, and it was pumice, it just, it just grinds you away like somebody put you up against a grindstone. He took his film out, put it in a protective bag, uh, uh, his bag he was carrying, and stuck it in a, under a rock uh, facing away from the explosion, and that film survived, and they developed it. And there's, there's just all kinds of documentation. Uh, most people have been removed. Uh, some people refused to go. Some people were just missing. They just, they've never found them because they were camping in the wilds and didn't know they were there or something. They just vanished. That Harry Truman stayed in his lodge. They tried to get him to move. He said, no, he's going to stay right on the mountain. So he's now under probably a thousand feet of that mountain when the mountain just blew off and just peeled over like that right on top of his lodge. Well, this is sort of the orientation here. Now let's look at a little something here. Here we have a diagram of the way things were before. There's the airplane flying. Here's that mound area with a vent, some steam and stuff coming out. Here's Spirit Lake. There's Harry Truman's Lodge. Here's the third ridge out and the photographer. That's the way it was at 8 o'clock that morning. And right after that explosion went off, then what happened here was that uh, this mound built up right here, see? Dotted line there, that mound built up. I still don't have that on there just right, do I? Let's get him on there just right. There we are. And so that mound was building up, and then when it blew out, it blew across this way. And here's that, uh, all that mountaintop coming off, going down into Spirit Lake. And it just covered up Harry Truman's Lodge, landed in the lake, in fact, some boulders landed in the lake so large there are now islands in the lake. That's just how large chunks were blown out. And this guy here, he beat a hasty retreat down the back side of this hill. And it's because these hills uh, were the height they were, it diverted the cloud up and over him. And that's the only way he was able to survive. Everybody in here, all the people that were left in there died. Nobody survived that thing. And I forget how many of them there were. But anyway... Then after, after, the, after the facts, here's what uh, this place looked like 
after it was over. Well, let's just look at this one by itself. Best way to do that. The mountaintop's gone. And the mountaintop now has, this used to be the profile. The dotted line's what used to be the profile of Mount St. Helens. The solid line's what it is now. So you can see all this up here is down here or in the bottom of the lake. And these are trees standing upright in the lake and also horizontal, and these are the new islands. And this dotted line here represents the uh, part of this mountain hill that's gone because of the waves that came up and sloshed back and forth and washed it away. Well, there's some very interesting things happening out there. One of them is that there's a million or so logs floating on the surface of the lake. And these logs are floating horizontal, and some logs are floating vertical like this. And every now and then, they get waterlogged and they go down in the bottom. And they go down the bottom and they stick into the deposits down there vertical or laying horizontal. And there's still all kind of deposits being uh, brought into this lake. And over the time, this couple of years period of time, these logs keep falling out. And the lake level now is 200 feet higher than it used to be. And these wave marks go from here to here. In other words, as it sloshed back and forth, it was emptying itself and filling up, bringing all this debris in, and all these logs that were floating there, it just it yanked, all these, it yanked these trees out of the ground right off of their stumps. In other words, or just ripped them right out of the ground with their stumps and flung them into the lake. And uh, for miles and miles out from this volcano, it just laid the trees down on the ground. You would not believe how many millions of trees this laid out on the ground up there. Well, right here, uh, you go to, to uh, Yellowstone National Park and you go to a place called Specimen Ridge. And you go to Specimen Ridge and there's nice big bronze plaques there, put up by the Park Service. And it talks about these, these trees that are standing upright, petrified. And it says, well, and there's, I think, 31 layers of them in this whole mountain, this ridge. 31 layers of vertical trees. A layer here, a layer here, a layer here. And they say the ocean came in and out that many times. And there was a forest there that many times. And the trees uh, fell over. And the ones that are sticking vertical, they just got, somewhere in there, they got petrified standing straight up. Now, I've always been amazed at trees that get petrified standing straight up. You might sell me a little bit on a tree getting petrified over a long period of time or something that lay in horizontal and got it covered up. But a tree that's vertical, you're going to have to have an awful big deposit to cover that tree up, you know, vertically. And if it's not totally covered up in one action, then the top part's going to rot off. Decay. You can't petrify the roots and leave the rest of the tree there for millions of years waiting for time and things to petrify the thing. Well, unless there was an awful lot of water standing over what's now Yellowstone, and unless on top of that water was all these logs floating, and these logs are falling out as the wind. See, on Spirit Lake, the wind can blow just a little bit, and you believe it or not, it can move those million logs to the opposite end of the lake. And the wind will turn and come this way and it'll move those logs to the other end of the lake. And as it's doing that, logs are dropping out. So what happens over here, you get some logs dropping out and the logs move away. More debris comes in. Later on, the winds bring logs back. Some more drops out in another layer. And then the wind moves the trees out again. Perfectly observable. That's what they're seeing out at, uh, at Spirit Lake. Scuba divers in the water, going down checking these things out. And also they found out that these logs rub each other on the surface of the water and they're debarking the logs. And the, the bark is falling off and the bark on the bottom of the water is already turning to lignite, the first formation of coal. So it looks as if coal then, the reason it's made in seams, is as the log mass from the great deluge, Noah's flood we call it, as it moved over, we had these log mass over eastern Kentucky quite a while because the bark got sloughed off and uh, then the wind moved it away and then the wind brought it back but at the same time the more debris had built up and if the wind moved the logs out real quick you just got a small seam of coal. If the logs stay there quite a while knocking the bark off you got a big seam of coal. And the reason it would have been nice and level like that is it's sediments settling out in layers. And uh, so that's a new theory on the formation of coal is that it's 
the bark off of trees floating on water and the, the trees are being debarked. And uh, so that's, that's uh, you can see that a flood of the magnitude, the worldwide flood, how many trees were there been floating on the water? A lot. Up in Montana where you have a hundred foot coal scene, there was a lot of trees conglomerated right there for some reason or another and debarked and made gigantic coal deposits. So somebody wonders where all the lush forest trees went from, from a totally tropical entire earth that was tropical, didn't have six-sevenths of it covered with water. It was only, you know, even less than one-seventh covered with water. Four big major rivers and, and some seas. No oceans like we know them. And uh, so there was lots and lots of uh, debris to make the code. Well, as you can see here, this log mass floating on the top of water, being moved around by wind and sloughing against each other is a good, observable explanation for the formation of coal and for the formation of a, of a polystratified petrified forest. And see, this makes much more sense than the uh, other theory that I hear uh, that's put out by the evolutionists about the petrification. They put that this is a a rare occurring circumstance. See, because they didn't know how much they had found or was available, and petrified wood wasn't all that well known. And uh, we have all kinds of petrified wood right here in Kentucky. You can go in most of your creeks that are rocky creeks. And if you look around, you can find some petrified wood. And the creek has uh, pretty well dimmed its features, but you can find it. You can find the petrified wood of a, like a type of pine tree. We find them around Clear Creek all the time. The guys, they'll be out working around a creek or something, and they'll bring me one of these and say, hey, here's another fossil, you know. And it, fossils are not rare. Fossils are fairly common. And uh, I have fossils of tree trunks. And uh, they got them out of the coal scene there in Bell County. I had them start saving them for me. They find them all the time. So we put a couple of those trunks in the back wall of the new building, academic building have there on the back of the science room on the outside. You can look up at that wall and you can see a, a, a two or three real nice stumps and you also see a limb of a tree about that long and about that big around a, or a stump, a stem. And I got that out of the Yuma Proving Grounds down in Arizona and uh, I had permission to get it. They allowed me to go in and do it. And so it's in the wall in our stone building. We use those as part of the construction stone. And uh, we have them scattered. They're scattered in several of the buildings there that's been built new or refaced, we have all kinds of fossils in those now. And you look around and you'll see these fossils in our building. Real common. I mean, you can find fossils all over the place. Well, this is one thing that happened out at uh, Mount St. Helens. A good theory on the formation of polystratified trees, uh, petrified, and the formation of coal. And then uh, here's what we're talking about when we say polystratified. And these are actually found in Australia, Nova Scotia, United States. You'll find several seams of coal, and you'll find a tree that's fossilized running through the coal seam, through the rock, through the coal seam, through the rock. In other words, you'll find these polystratified trees and uh, running through coal seams in different layers. And that is observable. Well, how about we're told mountains were made in millions and millions of years? Out at Mount St. Helens, there was rapid formation of strata in two years. Down here on 18 May 1980, the, the eruption started, and in nine hours, you built up a tremendous layer of pumice and ash. Then in one day, the 12th of June 1980, 25 feet of pumice laid down in small, thin layers like shale, actually hardened as rock. I mean, this now we're talking about a new cliff here. We're talking about a new cliff of 600 feet. And here in one day, topped it off here with uh, 19th of March, 1982. Two years later, uh, mud came in. And so now we have new strata formed of pumice and ash and pumice, which is laid out in little layers, and mud, all made within two years. And if you take a geologist out and you would show him this 600 foot uh, new structure, and you would ask him how long did it take to make this, what he would come up with is several hundreds of thousands of years or millions, and he'd come up with explanations of, of floods and oceans, and he'd give you all kinds of ideals. And he, if he did not know about Mount St. Helens, he would give you this theory. And then you would tell him this was made in two years, and you know what he'd say? 
Oh, no way. I mean, if you proved it to him, he said, well, it's an anomaly. So he'd just throw it out. So rapid uh, formation of mountains is not hard to come up with. How about the badlands of North Dakota? South Dakota. You see, when Mount St. Helens blew its top off, the top was covered with permanent ice. Well, see, if, you, if the ice is on top and you blow it out, the ice comes off first, and then here you have the ice on the mountain, and it blows out, the ice comes off first, and the mountain covers it up. Well, Mount St. Helens is a thermal area, and it's warm. So you had all this uh, top of the mountain over top of these gigantic chunks of ice. I mean, these chunks of ice were, you know, as big as London. Well, over time, this ice melted, and where the ice had been, this sumped in. It fell in. And then you get a little, little wind and a little water on it, and it eroded, and it looks just like the Badlands of South Dakota, made within a year or two, just a couple of years. So if you can make Badlands at Mount St. Helens in a couple of years, how can you say the Badlands in South Dakota in your bronze plaque from the National Park Service that's, uh, that it was made in hundreds of millions of years by wind and rain erosion? See, uh, that, that again, you, you can't say what you observe today, the rate you occurred today has always occurred in the past because you don't know what the past events have been. They're assuming that they know exactly what every event has been on earth, everywhere on earth, and they assume that it occurs exactly the way that they have determined that it's occurred. So here we have a demonstration now of this something, 550 degrees in here, this thermal area melting this ice and this something, and it winds up looking like the badlands of South Dakota. Well, let's look at some things. Mount St. Helens shows us that different water levels makes uh, wave marks on cliffs and rocks, but they can be made in a matter of a few weeks. Deposits, gigantic deposits can occur because of catastrophic events in the bottom of lakes and change the lake level at least 200 feet in a matter of one day. And uh, from those uh, deposits, you have all those trees starting to fall out into them, and now you set up the coal formation and you set up uh, you, your, uh, your polystratified trees and things like that. It, it can make bad lands. It can make strata formation. There's a 600 foot new cliff out there that was not there two years before. Canyon formation, that Thule River, remember that first one of you grass we, we showed? And it showed that two thirds of that mountain went over into the valley and it stopped up the Thule River. And it dammed it up. Well, what happened is, that thing broke through a couple of years later, and when it broke through, the water rushing through that, uh, that dam that had been made because of this volcanic explosion, when it was over that day or the next day or so, they had a 140th model of the Grand Canyon. In other words, showing that uh, this was fast erosion, it occurred just in a day or so, and so it substantiates the fact that the Grand Canyon's been made by fast erosion not slow erosion over hundreds of millions of years. Not the uplifting of the Kabab Plateau and the water ate it down because it was putting pressure against it. I mean, you know, water runs around. Water doesn't get up and go over something and eat its way through it. If, if I have water uh, flowing somewhere and I raise my hand up against this water, the water will build up behind it and spill over it, but it's not going to cut a hole through here. My hand is softer than sandstone. I'm sure it must be. And yet, out there in the Grand Canyon, this water is supposed to cut through there on the uplift of the Kebab Plateau. What makes better sense is that a big plateau, Noah's floodwaters went down. It trapped gigantic amounts of water. They substantiate that this lake covered most of Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and uh, uh, Nevada, I believe it is. and Or it might be Colorado. Nevada, I think. And anyway, the water was a mile deep. That's a tremendous amount of pressure. When it busts through the Kebab Plateau, it cut its way through there very quickly, fast erosion. That's the reason the Grand Canyon has the shape it has. It gives evidence of fast erosion, not slow erosion. That is observable. You, you can do experiments to show the difference between fast erosion and slow erosion. And then you compare those experiments with pictures of the Grand Canyon or whatever other erosion you have, it, and you'll know it's either fast or slow. Well, the Grand Canyon gives evidence of fast erosion, not slow erosion. So it cannot, did not form over hundreds of millions of years. 
wave marks, we talked about that over on New Guinea. They, these wave marks are supposed to have occurred over uh, 100 million years as the ocean levels went up and down, and yet we have wave marks, wave marks just like those on this rock layer of this hill across on the other side of uh, Spirit Lake that were made in a matter of just a few weeks or months. And uh, so you can't, you can't say, well, you can make wave marks at Mount St. Helens in a year or so, but that's an anomaly because over in New Guinea and other places, it took hundreds of millions of years. Well, let's get just a couple more out of the way. There's more and more things happening out there. The polystratification of trees uh, in deposits and coal formation. Uh, so those are just a few of the things that's happened at Mount St. Helens. Now there is a VHS tape and you can get it from the same place where you get the answers books or any of these other things. You can get it from um, Insti uh, the uh, uh, Answers in Genesis up at Florence, Kentucky. Uh, on a computer, I'm sure you can just put Answers in Genesis and uh, you'll find out the place up in Florence, Kentucky. Don't, don't do anything with anybody else if they're not at Florence because it could be somebody just trying to divert you. But uh, go to Answers in Genesis and uh, get into their list or catalog on tapes and there'll be a tape there by Steve Austin. He's a geologist and he was basically, I think, probably a theistic evolutionist before he went out and studied Mount St. Helens. And after he just, uh, studied Mount St. Helens, he's an absolute creationist now because he has seen all these events uh, that happened there which he was taught took long periods of time he has seen them that they have occurred just in a couple of few years and uh, there's a you want the revised tape it has the same information in it but Steve Austin is not a public speaker or a teacher relative to keeping your attention and keeping you awake and uh, but uh, they need to hire somebody dynamic to do the tape, you know. But here we have actually the geologist that studied it, which really goes a long way. And it will cause you to be able to tolerate. I mean, he, or seriously, he will just like, come on, show some emotions, you know. Just matter of fact information, you know, like a computer. And But what he says will absolutely thrill you to death. I mean, he explains all these phenomena. I've just introduced you to him. He will explain them to you. And uh, so you may want to try to find a copy of that, get a copy of it or something of that nature. Probably won't cost you more than $10, 20 the most probably. And I'm going to recommend you watch it once a week for 10 or 11 weeks. Then you'll begin to really appreciate it. First time you watch it, I say, wow, it overwhelms you. Second time you watch it, you say, I'm overwhelmed again. Third time, you're overwhelmed again. Because you missed so much the first time and the second time and the third time. And finally, about the fourth or fifth time, you start saying, now, wait a minute, this is all sort of working together. This, start, this is a big event. Next thing you know, you're learning from it. And as a result, you really um, discover that, hey, these things are not anomalies. These are observable events. They're real, and they defy evolution up one side and down the other. You are not going to see any information like this in the uh, releases in the newspaper because the people who release information in newspapers uh, are the editors of evolution-type organizations. Like this was uh, the articles had this morning, uh, the astronomer, astronomers, that article was probably released by the astronomy people, you know, that were in charge of this program doing all this research because they have all their names and their labs and everything. And so they either invited some reporter to come and interview them or they uh, submitted this to the paper for uh, uh, consideration. But every paper, just about it, uh, has all these articles in them. I mean, every day. If I were to, if I'd been saving all the articles just in the last 10 years, I would have a stack taller than I am that are pro-creation and nearly every one of them within a few months fall by the wayside like the, the, the matter, the living matter in the meteorite from Mars. I often wondered, how'd they know that meteorite was from Mars? I, I, that just amazed me that they knew this meteorite they found on the Antarctic ice shelf was from Mars. Now they found two or three of them from Mars. And I'm, I always want to say, how, how do they know it's from Mars? There's no way in the world they can know they're from Mars. Well, 
You have seen these before. What you have to do, you have to, there's a different opinion here, remove the preconceived uh, evolutionary process, and to remove the millions and billions of years, take the Bible seriously, you'll find your answer, uh, you know, to what happened, uh, how, where, and all that. In other words, you must get beyond, you must get beyond what we've been indoctrinated to. And uh, what's the future? Future restoration is for as the scripture is concerned, and we will do, dwell together peaceably. And of course, you know that evolution has no future uh, program like that. And, uh, you know, evolutionists, uh, one of their basic tenets in the book says, if you think about something long enough, it's just bound to have occurred. Well, they robbed that from us also. Psalms 119, 11 says, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. In other words, yes, it is true. If you think about something long enough, it's just bound to have occurred if you start with the right information to begin with. And the right information, of course, is that God created the heavens and the earth. And he did it in one week, six days. And he said it was very good. And we didn't start in chaos and survival of the fittest and fighting and killing and beating our way to the top and looking forward to the insects conquering us and looking forward to the death of our son and the, the loss of all life as it's known on the earth. That's the future from evolution. The future from creationism is that we can be restored to the God who created us and we can spend eternity in his presence. And if we decide not to do that, since we're eternal uh, human beings, we'll have to spend our eternity outside his presence and he's prepared a special place where he's going to choose not to be where those that choose not to spend eternity with him can go there. And that's called outer darkness. Next week we'll talk about evolution a little bit more.